This, 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 this show is brought to you by Safety FM. What's up, peeps? Welcome back to Rebounding Safety. Today, we are talking about mental health again, but from a slightly different perspective, which I think is going to complement the other couple of episodes that we've done as well. Let's jump into your intro and tell you some more about it. Let's go. The problem in safety isn't deviation, it's complexity. Health and safety has gone mad. Health and safety is trying to unpick having gone mad in the past. There's no one solution and one problem. The problem is that we are looking for one solution. Does the structure of the team allow them to flourish? Feel safe enough to be uncomfortable. The environment defines our behaviors. People aren't the problem, they're the solution. Rebranding safety, crushing the stereotype. Brought to you by Risk Blue. What's up peeps, welcome back to Rebranding Safety. Rebranding Safety is a YouTube channel and podcast doing exactly what it says on the tin so if you're new here hit that subscribe button hit the bell and all those magical algorithm buttons rebranding safety is the campaign of a company called risk fluent which i run uh, with my amazing wife sherry and we offer uh, numerous services we offer the technical services like normal health and safety stuff cash work at a high 45,001, things like that. Um, we offer transformational services like behavioral stuff, cultural stuff, strategy stuff. And then we also offer some media services. So two types of media customers. There's people that not work in our health and safety side that want us to take rebranding safety styles videos and create them some videos about how they manage their stuff, like an awareness video or something for their training or an induction video. And we take all of our gear, all of our skills, Skills, all of our knowledge, but also more importantly, our style, which is modern, entertaining, and fun. And we make you a bespoke video. Additionally, there is another side to it where maybe you're listening to this and you have a product or service that you would like to build brand awareness for to safety and operational leaders. And that's our audience. So there's opportunities for branded videos. There's opportunities for kind of advertisement within the podcast. So there's that that we offer as well. But most of you that are listening are operational safety professionals. So if you're thinking, Do you know what? I'd really like a video in our induction or I'd really like to add some videos that we can send round as a little reminder maybe of like this is how we manage lockout tag out at our company or here's a little reminder of our values or our principles for example and then we can come along and do that for you whether you want to be in front of the camera or you want us to be in front of the camera for you we're flexible, babes. If you're interested in any of that stuff, go to riskfluentlimited.com or email me, james at riskfluentlimited.com and we'll have a chat, we'll work it out and we'll go from there, peeps. Okay, so in the podcast today, we are talking to a lovely lady called Sheila. Great name, it's my grandma's name, that is. Outstanding name. So, Sheila runs another podcast. Ugh, competition. No. We don't see it like that. She runs a lovely podcast um, and she does it with a really nice guy called Peter. I'll let her tell us some more about that. Um, but essentially, it's all about mental health in the workplace. And today, we thought this would be a really nice complimentary episode to some of the other episodes we've done around the topic of mental health. So we've had Asher on a while ago to give a really personal experience and how she then turns that into kind of hypnotherapy and personal therapy and things like that and works with companies as well. Then we had Alex come on talk to us about his personal experiences of the outcome of burnout and, um, and essentially told a really personal perspective and then today Sheila's going to come on as she works with companies to help them kind of operationalize this uh, trying to understand how it needs to be part of your organization and in effect it's good to have it part of your kind of risk management so today essentially that is what we were talking about kind of the whys hows and the what fors of mental health from a risk management strategy i suppose perspective anyway i'm gonna stop waffling because these are probably the worst bulk recorded in intros and outros i've ever done in my entire life and hopefully Sherry is cutting these up to make them look good. Um, if not, I'm sorry. Let's jump into today's episode. Note to self, don't ask James to bulk record intros on a Monday at 10 past seven. <laughs> All right, Sheila, um, welcome to Rebound and Safety. Thank you very much for coming on the podcast. Thank you for having me, James. Yeah, good. How are you in general? Anyway, are you enjoying the weather? 
I am very happy when the sun shines. I'm very miserable when it's raining, although mm -hmm. um, I'm from Manchester, so I should be used to the rain. Oh, yeah, you must be miserable a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I know. That's why I moved down south. I live, in, I live down, down the south of the country now. I would say it's more technical down here. Um, and there's a certain point on the M6 where I know I'm nearly in the north. Uh, you just <laughs> more miserable as you go up north. No, no, no. I'm happy when I'm going up north. But there's a there's a point where the uh, yellow self storage is on the M6, and as soon as you go past there, it's almost like a line in the sky uh, where it turns from blue to grey. And I'm like, yep, I'm nearly, I'm nearly home. <laughs> just a wall of rain that you. Yeah. Just... <laughs> oh God, yeah. that's funny that is. Um, uh -huh. I, I think like I, was, I remember talking to a guy that does um does like mental health stuff in in Canada and he was saying um he was saying oh some people have this thing where like I can't remember the name of it but you have this thing that like their mood is really tied to the weather so when the weather's bad they're like they're it's they're, SAD yeah I think it's something like that and I am so like that the second the sun is out I feel so much better and I think a lot of people are like that but like for me I so much happier like noticeably absolutely feel it in my bones like i'm excited to get out of bed whereas when it's when it's wet and horrible i'm just like miserable <laughs> yeah no absolutely totally i totally get that 100 yeah. percent. it's very yeah. strange very strange yeah. Yeah. right do you want to give us a quick introduction of kind of what what you do who you are what you do and maybe how how you came to do what you do as well would be interesting yes yeah, sure sure um so my name's obviously sheila we've already said that established who i am uh, and and I'm on a company called BMR Health and Wellbeing. Um, so my background is um, in operations, uh, quality management, supply chain, business improvement. So I spent 30 years almost, it's giving my age away here, but I spent almost kind of 25, 30 years in that, um, in that space. And during my time kind of working in that space, I obviously had to manage staff. I was one of those managers that came through the process, you know, in the, with that attitude of the, the, the 80s and the 90s, where we just, you know, we made the tough stuff, you know, mental mental health, what's that? That's people in the lunar bin. You just need to pick, yeah. up, pick yourself up and get on with it yeah. um, and, and, and be resilient, basically. If you're, if you're depressed, just just don't be depressed. Just get up. Yeah, just, just smile, be happy, pull yeah. yourself together, you know? Come on. Yeah. yeah, and um, and basically, in my in, in one of my previous roles, I was working in an organisation. We had people within that business, is relatively um, small number of staff, but people that would struggle with mental health um, issues from kind of occasional um, challenges to kind of longer term issues. And as a manager in that business, um, I went through lots of different things. So one would be frustration because I wanted them to just pull themselves together and do something about it. Yeah. Uh, frustration then when you would talk to look for support within the organization and nobody else knew what to do, but because it was mental health, let's just avoid it like the plague and not touch it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so therefore you end up with a lot of, and we hear it a lot, talked about a lot, but this presenteeism piece where you pay people to turn up to work, but they're not getting the best out of work. You're not getting the best out of them. And yeah. nobody's really happy. So we recognise, you know, through my experiences of work, through being, you know, the manager that thinks just need to pull yourself together to then actually uh, having staff that were struggling. And then actually by the age of 40, I unexpectedly uh, was with child. Mm. Um, and, you know, having a child after a certain age and then having this all you know these different changes in my life um things became more challenging and my like work life um balance changed I had other priorities um and I started to struggle with actually being a working mom and then for the first time in my kind of you know 40 odd years on this planet um back then um I started to struggle so, and I think a lot of the times when, until you actually start to struggle or have got somebody close to you that starts to struggle, it's really difficult to empathize with mental health. It can be really, really difficult to empathize with somebody that's struggling, especially that somebody that might be struggling over a long period of time, because you're just thinking, for goodness sake, just pull yourself together. Mm. It's not difficult. Mm. But actually, once you then start to experience that, you do understand how difficult it is and it's not a case of just pulling yourself together you can't just snap out of depression you yeah. can't just get over anxiety so that really started to open my eyes up to 
how employers have a real um, need to support people in their business, not just because we're human beings and it's the right thing to do, but also because by not doing that, we're leaving money on the table. Let's be honest, we're leaving money on the table because we'll miss opportunities. We're not getting the best out of people. We're just paying people to turn up and to be present and not to be doing. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I recognize the fact that, you know, if this was a production line and something was broken in the production line, yeah, and we were getting um, faulty widgets coming off the production line, we would get to work on the root cause, be it the machine that's causing the widgets to be broken. Yet when it comes to workplace mental health and individuals, we don't get to work on the root cause. We get to work on either, or we focus on the individual mm. and we either focus on the individual and we do nothing and we just let it slide and hope it gets better. Or um, we focus on supporting the individual with interventions like mental health first aid and employee assistance. So yeah. um, I started BMR Health and Wellbeing to um, basically bring in some of these continuous improvement principles and, and principles like, um, you know, Kaizen, you know, just continue small, small incremental changes done consistently over time, mm. but apply to workplace mental health programs so that we weren't okay. just, so that organizations are not just doing initiatives mm. because by the definition of an initiative, it starts and then it finishes. Yeah. And, you know, if we did quality, as an initiative if we did safety as an initiative um, and if we did customer satisfaction as an initiative we wouldn't have very successful businesses mm. so why is the welfare and the productivity of our staff often associated with initiatives rather than whole organizational operational systemic and cultural approach yeah and that's what we do so it's a very long answer to your question <laughs> sorry no. i mean as elevator pictures go as long as it's a really tall building that's really good that's <laughs> it's really a tall good. building <laughs> as long as it's like a high rise <laughs> yeah that's what we aim for <laughs> i'm exactly the same as you if someone's like oh, what do you do james i'm like well back in 2001 <laughs> yeah <laughs> Uh, I, I think you've, you've hit on quite a lot of interesting points there as well. Like we've recently just done, um, recently just uh, done a, another podcast um, with a gentleman called Alex, who um, I do quite a, a lot of stuff with. He comes to the um, PM community and, um, and he randomly messaged me like, James, I want to come on the podcast. And I'm like, okay, cool. And he's like, I want to talk about this. And he was like, we were talking about burnout and doing mental health initiative and mental health first aid week and all of this, uh, sorry, mental health week and all of this stuff. And he said, but we're not fixing a problem. He said, we're kind of just like putting a plaster over the bullet wound. And when, when no one wants to actually address the real thing, we're just talking about bean bags and pizza Fridays and stuff like that. Um, so he said, I want to come on and I want to just tell my story about how my burnout led me close to the real edge. Um, and it was a hard it. conversation. Like it was one of those podcasts, you run a podcast and, and we need to uh, make sure that we give a plug of that. It was kind of one of those podcasts where as a, as a host, I didn't really say much. I just, he just told his story and it was, mm. it was kind of beautiful, but like harrowing at the same time. And then we had another lady on a while ago called Asha, who's a psych no who's a hypnotherapist and she went to hypnotherapy after essentially being pushed right to the edge and and experiencing some really really hor horrible kind of stress related mm -hmm. issues um and now has kind of done the same and has gone out there started a business and off she goes trying to stop people experiencing what she's experienced mm -hmm. as well um so it's really nice to 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 see but, but ultimately, do you think, and I'll bring it around to my, my point now, <laughs> um, do you think the issue with it is just like the companies, business owners and so on, they want to do something, but ultimately it's just huge, isn't it? Like this is really complex and big. Like you say, it's not an initiative. It's like a, 
sometimes it could be potentially change the way you operate as an organization um and it could but you know you can't just do pizza fridays and mental health first aid whilst those stuff are probably good it is do you, it's, it's a big project do you think it's it's a consistent project it's part of culture yeah, yeah. and it's it's behavior change and I, I was recording a podcast yesterday um and you know one of the things that we were talking about there you know was the um and you're probably too young to remember this james but you know back in the 70s and the eight uh, well we yeah, are back in the 70s there was the the big campaign the big safety campaign around seat belts in cars yep so clunk click every trip yep yep and uh, we were chatting about this yesterday uh, the other day and you know with that that was aimed at getting behavior changed for safety in cars primarily to men yeah and engaging them in a way and speaking to those people in a way that would connect with them that would encourage them to actually make that behavior change that was that took years of of kind of instilling that as a safety culture now we wouldn't get in a car without that yeah we wouldn't get in a car and be able to drive off because the beeping would drive you mad for starters but it's become something so ingrained in culture that it's it's everywhere yeah. OK. And with things like workplace mental health, you know, when I go back again, I'm showing the age here, but, you know, <laughs> back when I first started working like in the late 80s, you know, BS 575 or ISO 9001, as it's known in today's money, right, was this new ISO standard that was a quality management system that became this framework for how we should structure our business, business process and make sure we had continuous improvement in around quality. Today, there are thousands, millions of certificates issued worldwide, globally, because this has become an adopted framework. Back when I was putting it in as BS 5750, this was a new shiny thing and everyone was a bit scared of it and an auditor would come in and we had to learn this new way of working. And then we all went, well, actually, this actually does bring value. This brings structure. This brings organisation. And actually, it's not set in stone. It's flexible. And then we've got other standards that come out, things like 14,001 for the environmental piece. So these things bring around change. But when we're looking and when businesses are looking at workplace, mental health strategies, solutions, programs, they're looking for a quick fix. Mm. And there's no quick fix. This is behavior change. If people in your workplace are becoming ill as a result of work, It's generally not because they are flaky, non-resilient, overly sensitive um, individuals that are just not very good at coping with life. Yeah. It's generally because somebody that would ordinarily be quite a strong and resilient person. So you mentioned two people that you've had on your podcast before have been stretched and pushed to the limit. Yeah. And like an elastic band, as human beings, we're designed to have some level of tension. Yeah. Tension motivates us. It makes us do our job. We need some sort of pressure to motivate us to get out of bed in the morning. You know, if we're not going anywhere. We've got nothing to do. We don't set the alarm. Where's that motivation to get up? So we need some level of motivation. Mm. But when that's stretched and stretched and stretched and stretched, what does an elastic band do? Mm. It snaps. It breaks. And, and, and that's what we need to look at we need to look at the workplace we need these longer term strategies and we need to look at what we can do in workplaces so you mentioned before about mental health first aid health promotion fruit bowls yoga great bookends yeah really great bookends yeah that's the top end you know the front end bookend of health promotion yeah Somebody who's struggling and up to their eyeballs and not on on the laptops till 11, 12 o'clock at night and up again at six in the morning. Yeah. Ain't going to be finding time to go to your yoga classes. Yeah? yeah. These initiatives are put in and people wonder why nobody turns up to yoga on Friday. Mm. Yeah. Too busy working through the lunch. Yeah. And then you've got the people that actually were struggling, 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 and they just got sick. So those are the ones that were turning up every day. We knew something wasn't quite right, but we never, we don't have the mechanisms in place to capture that or support that. Mm. Um, they didn't get themselves well. Um, and then we just kind of ignored it and it fixed itself. Yeah. Uh, so instead of that happening, it's going to go one way or the other. And instead of that going up, happening, they go off sick. And they don't go off sick like you do for three days with a cold or a bad headache or a migraine. First thing the doctor will do, they'll sign you off for two weeks. Yeah. 
and then another two weeks, another two weeks. So it will be a couple of months potentially that people will be out of the organisation. So yeah. it's really expensive. It's really expensive. And what we need to be doing as businesses, as business leaders, is really looking at what are the factors in my workplace that are damaging people and causing people to fall over. And, you know, using these health and safety risk management principles that we have in place already, we wouldn't have people turning up to a building site and constantly going up a ladder without a safety harness and falling off scaffolding. We wouldn't just go, here's a team of mental health, uh, physical first aiders. We've got a direct um, route to the hospital. We can get you in there and get your leg plastered up quick as. And then have a few weeks off and come back. But don't worry, we'll get somebody else to pick up the slack. Mm. We won't do that with it. It's not acceptable to do that for physical health. Yeah. Yet, actually, that's exactly what we're doing in a lot of instances with psychological health. Yeah. And yet the law says that we have the exact same duty of care to risk assess the psychological health i.e. the health part of the health and safety at work act yeah as we do for physical as, as we do for physical and in the past we haven't done that because the focus has been on safety mm. and yes there is still safety issues out there but by and large it's accepted that we have this duty as an employer to look after safety and safety is everybody's responsibility so you know you see um a dodgy you know, you know, a garden on a machine that's not there, you'll report it, yeah? If you see a pallet in the middle of a walkway, you'll get somebody to move it. So we, we, we're, we're built into that. It's, it's second nature. Mm. Now we need to do that work, that piece, that education, that behaviour change, that culture change, that leadership buy-in on the health piece. Yeah. And we're getting there, but it's a slow journey it's not an overnight fix like you said but now there are more tools available to employers there mm. are more tools available to h and health and safety professionals there are more tools available to hr professionals and we are now seeing roles being developed for well-being directors for people directors yeah. um, so we're starting to see that change but there's still a huge education piece to be done on what is the right solution. And that's where I really love the fact that, you know, the ISO standards committee have developed an ISO standard. You can see that I've got a bit of a, I've got, I'm a bit of a geek. I'm a bit of a fangirl when it comes to ISO standards, when they're okay. used well and implemented well. Mm -hmm. um, but there's now this framework, you know, the world's, some of the world's best leading health experts in this field, some of the countries that are leading the way, like Canada and Australia in this field, they've all come together to put together a framework of best practice guidance on how to do this. And you take that framework, you don't apply it verbatim, you apply it like you would a 9001 standard or an environmental standard to fit with your business, to fit with your people, to fit with your organizations. So now somebody's gone and done all the hard work for you. They've just said, this is how you do it. You know, if you're an organization, I can't remember the number, but I think if you're less than 25 million pound turnover, you even get the standard for free. Mm. You don't have to pay 200 quid to get the standard now from BSI. Yeah. You can download it for free straight off the, um, uh, by registering on the website. So the hard, the, the, the kind of, on the groundwork's been done. What organisations need to do now is say, I, this is what I'm now going to start to do. Yeah. I'm going to do a gap analysis on where I am, where I should be. I'm going to look at all the tools and all the initiatives that we've put in place, all the money that we're spending, yeah? And have a look whether we can measure a, a usage, a return on investment, that we can quantify what that's doing for us. Mm. Because if you can't quantify it, why do it? You can't measure what you're doing. If it can't tell you whether it's having an impact, why do it? Yeah. You wouldn't do that in any other area of your business. No. I was just trying to get the, the number that of, of people, but I typed in Google just quickly while she were talking. Then I typed in Google uh, 45,000 and free, free download. And you can read the whole thing online. Yeah. 
So it looks That's like it. it's pretty free to everybody. It is free to, yeah, you can read it online from the ISO website for free yeah. to everybody in the world. Yeah. And then if you go on to BSI, you can register for a free PDF copy that BSI will email to you right. if your organization size is less than 25 million. And another thing about the standard, just to mention, okay. is that um, you can get certified to the standard. Uh, and it's a child standard of ISO 45001. Um, and normally a child standard, you wouldn't be able to get a separate certification for. Mm -hmm. But on this particular standard, you can. Just trying to find, I'll, I'll try and find the link for that and put it in the show notes if I can. Um, mm -hmm. I can't find the free download one, but yeah. I do, do you think, because um, interestingly, you've got 45,003, but prior to 45,003, the HSE had the management standards, which, mm -hmm. which which I still highly rate. You know, like Absolutely. The, I mean, I, I haven't done work within 45,003 but I've definitely when it came out when I a few webinars I've read through it and it and to me I'm like do you know what there's a lot of echoes of the management standards in here like and and do you but do you think that the fact that to your point there to the fact that you can now get accredited so you can get the badge and it's got like a commercial advantage to it so you can say to your customers for example we're accredited to 45,001 and three and nine fat 90. Do you think like that will help drive this forward? Because it surprises me even to this day, the amount of people that have never heard of the HSE management standards. And, and I think they are great. I think they yeah. are absolutely, I'd go so far to say, I think that is the best piece of work the HSE offers. I think that that manage, those management standards, the guide, everything you can download is phenomenal. Yeah, absolutely. And you're right, they've done, you know, they've done a lot of work. And I I, I'm, I host a podcast as well with uh, with Peter Kelly from the HSE, who was, you yeah. know, Peter was involved in the development of the stress management standards. Uh, Peter was also involved in the development of 45,003. So he was on the development committee for that. Um, and you're right, it's an absolute great piece of work. And everything that you find in the stress management standards is part and parcel of, of, of 45,003. And then the other extra stuff say that the Canadian standards have right. in place, they've been brought, you know, elements of that have been brought in. And the so it's best practice from around the world. So why would you not use it? And it's not only best practice, these are frameworks that are suited at a global level. Mm. So from different cultural things, different kind of country differences, all of that's been taken into account while this has been done. So I think it will gain traction. Um, you know, if you look at the number of certificates that are out there for ISO 45001 now, you know, they're in the hundreds of thousands. And yeah. that's grown hugely. Um, I'm just trying to find the stat now. Um, so I've been going through all the stats this morning. But um, it's still quite young, really, isn't it? 45001. It's, it's still a very young standard. Obviously, there was 18 uh, before that. But but. Um, as a, as a new standard, it's very, I think it's quite a lot different from eighteen. Uh, in my yeah. opinion, um, it's quite a young standard. It is. It is a very young standard. I'm just trying to find the numbers for you um, now. I've got that many blooming um, stats and numbers around the place, but um, I think the numbers now are in the hundreds of thousands yeah. on um, how many forty five thousand and one certificates have been issued, and mm. and if you overlay forty five thousand and three on that. All the clauses are exactly the same. But what it does is it just really puts the meat around the bones on the psychological risk assessment piece. Yeah. And again, people are like, oh, how do we risk assess psychological well-being? Well, you know, we have a fantastic technology tool that allows you, it, it honestly, it's unbelievably fantastic, but it's a whole ISO 45003 management system. Mm. So it's got the educational piece for the whole organisation. Yeah. It's got the well-being tools for the employee. It's got the data analytics, the survey tools, and the risk assessment piece. Um, it's got the you know measurement and monitoring of continue uh, improvement actions, so that we can actually start to measure and quantify and correlate well-being initiatives to improvements in productivity, to improvements in retention rates, to improvement in absenteeism. So we're able to do all of that now in one single place mm. in a really simple and systemic way what it needs is that organizational commitment from top down and also bottom up because it has to be done 
in collaboration. There's not one single entity, individual department that can do this. This needs to be approached in the same way as we approach customer satisfaction, the net promoter scores, our, you know, our quality management numbers. It needs yeah. to be done in that way. It has mm. to be operationalized into the business. Yeah. yeah. I think there's something else that you said earlier, which is really important. Like it, it, when you when you said I love ISOs when implemented correctly. Yes. So I feel like you might have had a similar experience with ISOs as I have. Like there is a big difference between implementing for the badge. Absolutely. Implementing for impact within your within your organization. Absolutely. Um, like and, and I, I actually like to use um I'm not going to get into politics. I have no support of one person or another uh, publicly on the profile. But I remember during COVID, Nicola Sturgeon said, um, I want people to act within the spirit of the law, not the word of the law. And I Absolutely. thought that was really nice. And I actually have taken that and use it quite a lot in the, you know, if you're going to do 45,003, 180, uh, sorry, 14 or nine, like implement it with the spirit of it, not the word of it, which Absolutely. I really like. I, will, I, I worked in an organization previously and they had ISO 9001 certification, right? And I went past the quality department and there were literally piles, and I mean, paperwork piles of return notes, right? Yeah. And the auditors had come in and uh, managers would have certain individuals in the organization take days holidays on those days. So the auditors yeah. couldn't talk to them because they knew that they'd drop them in it. <laughs> 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 And it was, it was, and it was just literally, let's do the bare minimum to get us through the audit because they didn't understand the value at that time of a well implemented um, quality management yeah. system. And it was, oh, we need to get the certificate because that's what everybody else is doing. Yeah. You know, we can't be in this game without at least 9,001 as a certificate. Yeah. Right. And I came in and I was given the quality department and they were like, um, okay, so. There you go. I was like, great, lovely, fantastic. And started working on it and really just changed the way and brought people along on that journey with me. But don't get me wrong, it took a while, took a couple of years to kind of get that change through. And that's the thing, it does what it does warrant this and it needs this commitment. Can't promise anybody you're going to change anything overnight. It doesn't happen, change management, change, change behavior, behavior change doesn't work that way. Yeah. Um, but anyway, long story short. That company then went on to get um, to have a fantastically robust 9001 system. Nobody took holidays when the auditors came in. <laughs> you could send the auditors to talk to anybody, yeah, because yeah. they were following this in the spirit in which it was intended, in a way that served at the business, in the way that protected the business, in a way that grew the business, okay? And then on the top of that, after we got 9001 boxed off and we got that working well, we then went for medical approvals. We then got aerospace approvals and everything that company does, they can sell off the back of quality. Mm. Yeah. And, and, and having all of this in place, because that was actually a, a massive requirement from their customer network. And, you know, we saw that in real tangible results in terms of, the, you know, the numbers of returns that were down, you know, first time, you know, on time, every time, first time, you know, delivery rates, all the numbers were in the right place. Mm. Um, and that's taking it from not doing it well, doing it to the, le you know, the letter of the auditor comes in and goes, oh, you're not quite conforming to that. There's a cross, there's a non-conformance. And you're like, but I don't need to do that because of this. Yeah. No, computer saying clipboard says no. Yeah. You know that whole, that old school kind of um, approach, and mm. and I think if you know the whole point of having these in, they're like a ring fence around a schoolyard to protect the kids, to keep yeah. the kids safe. Yeah, and it's the same principle I think with ISOs for your business. Yeah, kind of freedom to operate within that framework, e.g. Yeah. yeah, and if the framework needs to change, change the framework. If the process changes, change the process. Mm. If that's what needs to happen. If our business is evolving, that's no longer relevant. But that's what continuous improvement is, isn't it? Mm. We're constantly evaluating. And because we move at such a fast pace, 
why would we not want to be doing that? Mm. And why would we not do that for staff and culture? Yeah. And working practices and work design, you know? Mm. But, you know, talk about 45,003. You know, I remember years ago when we had a warehouse and it was backlogged. It had those attempts, not getting further forward. And it was like, oh, my God, it's a disaster. You know, we can't get stuff out to collect customers on time, blah, 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 blah. Fast forward a couple of years later, right? Like today, we'd call that stress and we'd send people on resilience training, yeah? Mm-hmm. That wasn't stress and resilience training. It was stress. It was a stressful situation. But that wasn't stressed individuals. And that, if, if that was in today's spotlight, we'd be sending them all on mental health first aid courses and sending them to resilience training, okay? But not fixing the problem. That what may- we did back then, because that wasn't the buzzword then, mm. is we got somebody in to help we put everybody on a lean lean techniques course yeah um and we got them to all of their activities that they did through that process were targeted at their own working area their own working environments you wouldn't recognize the place further two years further down the line yeah and again another one of those places that we take customers around with pride Mm. and you know and that wasn't a case of you know we had one or two printers in the warehouse serving 16 people you know, but get everybody a tool belt, get everybody a shadow ball, get everybody a printer. Reorganize your workspace. You know, we're talking about work design and job design. And, you know, there's all this job crafting and all this other stuff now that people talk about. But, mm. you know, change the way that we do the work to make it more efficient. Everybody's happy. Yeah. Yeah. It's that simple. I, I love what you kind of said earlier and that analogy. And, and it's very similar to when I, I well, it, it was pretty much exactly the same in that. I was talking to a client a few weeks or months back and we ended up talking about um, stress management and stress risk assessments and stuff. And I said, oh, what, what do you currently do? Oh, we, we do like a, a regular piece of awareness and then we've got some mental health first aiders uh, and we've got a, a phone line. I said, okay, cool. So do you think that that's good enough? Do you think that's a, yeah, I think, I think it's, it's all right. I said, okay, cool. If I said to you, you can have no guarding on your machine, you're not going to manage it, and you use this exact analogy, um, if you had no guarding on your machine, no nothing, and and I said to you, how do you manage safety? And I said, what you do is you tell everyone where the kind of pinch points are and the drawing points are. You don't guard them or anything. And then what you say is, uh, we've got an ambulance on call. Um, Would you say that was good enough? And he was like, well, obviously not. And I was like, well, that's that's what we do with mental health. That's what you're doing it now. Um, and, and he was like, not really. And I was like, think about what you've just said. And it, <laughs> it took a good 10 minutes and it was quite kind of a conversation. And I'm thinking, shit, I'm trying to get some work here. And I think I might have pissed him off. Uh, <laughs> and um, and I was like, oh. and then and then he kind of started to come around and he was like, do you know what, actually, I get it. I really liked your bookends analogy. It's kind of like having two bookends um, and not having the shelf, just, just holding them together with pressure and hoping that they don't fall. Yeah. Um, and and we finally got got round to the point, and then then I said, look, there, there's a couple of ways to do this. We've got ISO forty five thousand and three. I said we could we could even just start with thinking about the management standards. I said let's just start there to introduce you to the concept, have a chat about that, and then let's have a read about forty five thousand and one. So it doesn't, you're not going in 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 kind of the deep end, so to speak. But um, and, that, and that's get it. that's the thing with this as well. And you know, I was talking to another lady um, some time ago, and she used a great analogy. And it's it's a it's a marathon. It's not a sprint. It's like page to five k. You don't go and decide you're going to run a marathon and just put your shoes on and, and hit hell for leather for twenty six point two miles. Yeah, yeah. You start to walk. You just do a five k. You'll do a ten k. You know. And then we do this. You know. We start to talk to staff. We have regular review meetings. We do some check ins with them. We start to gather some data. We have some feedback sessions. What works? What doesn't work? What would you like to see? We consult with staff and we. We break it down into a really simple model. Act, yeah? Yeah. Ask people Mm -hmm. uh, what in the workplace is impacting their well-being, how often it impacts them and how severely. Consult with them when they've told you. So you've told us this, so now we want to invite you in to have a discussion with us and tell us what we can do to resolve some of those issues and then together we take action i like that dead simple 
Oh, I'm going to write that down. That's a good one, that is. Okay. Just copyright that, mate. <laughs> I copyrighted that. Yeah. <laughs> Call it the act model. <laughs> <laughs> I really like that. I think that's nice. I like little things like that, that, that people can just kind of, you know, use that as like a heuristic in their... In their yeah. I don't feel like I've made it unless I've got my own three-letter acronym for my business. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, you've, got have, you've got to have a three-letter acronym. <laughs> If there's even a good <laughs> free that right. I think that's that's really nice. I like that. And and I and I think as well, like it's 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 interesting, isn't it? Because it was actually Peter that um who you do the podcast with, and I, I invited him along when I was a head of safety for um the Glass and Glazing Federation. I brought him along to do a webinar um for, okay. for our members, and um he was quite blunt in the beginning it was really good um and i, I love him like, i've had like, a couple of chats with him like one two yeah. and i'm like oh, mate i need to go for a pint with you like but, <laughs> um, you could join me in, join him in his online pub you know yeah 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 is it, is it moved over from the coffee lunchtime to the pub now is it online pub? oh he's always had both oh has he oh, yeah you can that. go on if you go on later in the afternoon um you can pop into the pub <laughs> word of warning it's quite difficult to get out that's, that's <laughs> <I'm only kidding. laughs> um, but yeah and he he literally was just like it was a zoom call and he was like oh just um, put your digital hands up if you've got a stress risk assessment and only one put one company and we had a few members in there put the hand up and he said um everyone else who hasn't put the hand up i can i could enforce on you now yeah he said, absolutely you you need a, a stress risk assessment within your organization and you just saw like the faces kind of just go and it was just like mm. holy shit and i was a bit like told you so <laughs> like, like, i've been trying to help you but it was really nice that he was blunt and then then i mean you know what he's like then he was just really helpful from there onwards and gave of them loads of advice how yeah. to move forward but it was just that little wake-up call that, that i think a lot of us needed and 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 um and, and i think it's really interesting when you when you kind of go into organizations and to come back to your point i think a lot of people just don't know where to start with this stuff absolutely absolutely and that's you know if we go back to this that's why we started this business yeah you know that's exactly what we do if you don't know where to start that's absolutely fine not to know where to start but it's absolutely not fine Stop. not to start and not to do anything yeah. because of it because you don't know yeah. yeah you don't know how to drive a car you don't not ever drive a car yeah you go and learn how to do it. Yeah. Yeah. Otherwise, we'd all be sat in on our asses wearing nappies still. Yeah. You know, we learn to do things. I also wonder as well, though, Sheila, like, do we overcomplicate it a lot? Like, hugely. I think we think, oh, stress risk assessment. Like, I need a psychologist. And I think, I think yeah. 100%, there's a point where there's a line where, like, it stops being a job for a generalist or a manager and it starts becoming, I need a specialist. But, but ultimately, I think you can go, I think okay. I can TikTok for like two minutes and see symptoms of, pe of, of bad management that's in, in, like encouraging stress. I saw one yeah. there and a woman, a lady I follow, and she went, oh, I, I realized really early on in my career that the, the, the reward for being efficient is, is get, you get given more work. And I was just like, that's such a good little analogy, isn't it? Like Absolutely. what you said, we're stretching the elastic band and we found the point where they're doing really well and they're really efficient because mm. they've stretched to a nice level of, of stress and they're pushing themselves and they're being challenged and they're, and they're thriving within it. So what we go and do is we give them more and then they get that done. And then we go, oh, wow, they're just... So it breaks. How can I stretch it? And then we give them some more. And then the band, and then, and then it snaps. And then we go, oh, Sheila's just, she, Sheila's just a bit she's soft. A bit of, that's all. She's a bit of a flake. <laughs> flake that's all. Shame, because she used to be good back in the day, but you know what it's like now. Get rid of her for a couple of weeks and then bring her back and just reduce her workload. And But then once Sheila starts feeling better because her workload's reduced, she then... Absolutely. Or oh, Sheila's never the same again because she's got you know the kind of workplace stress equivalent of ptsd yeah yeah exactly and and so, i just you know what i mean because at that point that individual then feels weak they feel like they lose self-confidence they lose self-esteem and you don't really you don't you, you look you run the risk of potentially not getting that that whole person back back ever yeah, yeah. in your in your work organization and that person yeah. has to work on on rebuilding themselves i know because i know that from personal experience yeah. you know but just picking up um james on what you just said there about at some point we need a specialist yeah 
when we're coming, when we're looking at this, say that this health and safety piece, well, I don't really know that. I'm not a psychologist. What I would say is if you're health and if you're a health and safety professional and you're risk assessing a construction site or a digger or a farmer in a field with a big one of them big nasty combine harvesting mm -hmm. things that yeah, chop yeah. people mm -hmm. up with fall in them. Um, do you need to be a specialist about how the machine works? Very good. Or do you bring in a specialist engineer when you identify the need for one? Hmm. I like that. That's a good point. So, 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 you, no, so yeah. as a safety professional, we can facilitate the, the, the kind of act like a GP in a way. It's like, this doesn't seem right. This doesn't seem right. No, um, as a safety professional, you use the basic risk management principles that you've got. Yeah. So we do, you know, the risk assessment. And that risk assessment might throw out that, uh, I don't know, 75% 75% of people in a high risk environment. So 75% of scaffolders, for example, yeah, have said that they are scoring really high on burnout. Yeah. Yeah. You've flagged a risk there. Yeah. Oh, you've and and then what do we then do? That you, you then don't you would know there's no way that you would want that health and safety professional to go in there. Yeah and try and resolve burnout, they would then flag up in your organizational risk register, this is a, this is a red area of concern. Mm -hmm. This has the potential for high accident rates mm -hmm. in a physical level. And this also has potential for kind of high absence rates, et cetera, et cetera. What are we going to do about it? We need to find an engineer or a provider to resolve this for us. And we need to understand what's contributing to that. And that might be the pressures on a site that are coming from, you know, unrealistic completion dates that are causing things to be shortcutted for safety. Yeah. When it comes to workplace mental health and people's mental health, we throw all logic out the window. Uh -huh. And we go into panic mode thinking that we need to know how to be soft and softly. Ditch the fluff. Go back to some of the um, structure of the processes that we already have. You're already doing it. I'm just going to tell you, these are a different set of hazards and this is a different bunch of questions to ask. Mm. But pull the results together in the same way or a similar way. Do you know what I mean? You're using oh, the same true. principles. And this is the problem. With, you know, Everybody's out there trying to reinvent the wheel. You've got the wheels, yeah? But you've got three at the minute. You've got quality, you've got safety, yeah? You've got customer service, but your fourth wheel on your wagon, your people, your culture, your environment, you're not applying any of those three sets because within quality, within, within safety, um, with all those things I've just said, you're using the same principles. Mm. you're using the same principles but well-being oh it's got people involved in it that must be different i need to do something different no quality's got people involved in it customer satisfaction's got people involved in it safety's got people involved in it you just do the same bloody thing yeah uh, that's a good point that's a good point i, I was going to question really like uh is the safety profession competent to to be doing this so I think that's um you've kind of you kind of answered that that question. Where, but where... I would what I would also add to that though, James, is that it's not just the safety profession's uh, responsibility. Again, going back to what I said earlier, it's everybody's responsibility. Somebody needs to own it as a as a driver of that within an organisation. Right. But health and safety can't necessarily do it on their own. There might be some people stuff that needs to come in. It might be a change in um, HR process practices or it might be a change in management or in leadership or uh, a change in operations. So it needs to be this top level approach. Again, yeah. you know, we don't have just safety professionals responsible for safety. Going back to what I said before, they hold jazz hands. We're all responsible for safety. Everybody has to, it has to be a cross functional cross-organizational approach otherwise it will fall over it's an interesting it topic isn't it because it seems to bounce around a lot of people like who who owns it within an organization like i i feel like 
you've got a bit of tug of war for, for like mental health and well-being between like HR and health and safety, like who wants to own it. And, and, and I, I don't know whether like both, pref- I don't know, this is me just speaking like from ob- observing the, the, the world that I see. And like, it just feels like both professions are tugging at it to try and show that they're still relevant in a way like they both have our own brands and our own sh- things that we're struggling with like the preconception of safety and so on and so forth preconception of hr higher fire and all of that um they've both got their own little preconceptions that they're struggling with and and it feels a bit like we've gone oh let's take stress and well and we're kind of tugging at it from each mm-hmm. other we're like fighting as to who takes it um, would you have an opinion on if does it matter who takes it as long as somebody as takes long as it gets done doesn't you know, matter so you don't you think know? one profession is better to have it than the other I think they've all got value to add I yeah. think there's you know if you look at 45,003 yeah it's been specifically put under an occupational health and safety management system it's a health and safety issue yeah okay it's it's the health bit of a safety issue yeah. however it involves people and a lot of the standard would look at competency, resources, yeah. development, leadership. So it needs input from, from HR. Uh, it needs input from other areas in the business. So it can't just be, yes, one person can be the driver for it. Yeah. Yeah. But we all own, we all own a piece of responsibility that goes with that. And this is why it's vital that it's a strategic boardroom agenda item. Mm. This is why it's vital that it's making it onto risk registers, that we've got these same processes in place. You know, I even say, you know, have you got have people got a mental health policy? No. Have you got a health and safety policy? Yeah. So my suggestion would always be don't dilute mental health by having a separate policy. Potentially. Yeah. You've already got a health and safety policy. Just make sure you do the health bit. Mm, I think make sure you're more specific on the health bit because if you if you then go this is health and safety so we all do that and we know when we join an organization we have to do that safety bit we have to watch the fire training you know what you know the manual handling courses we have to do this this that and the other make the mental health piece part of that process Mm. if you're telling people when they're joining your organization we recognize this it's a value to us it's of importance to us your well-being is a value to us and we have we have systems and, and we have uh, mechanisms in place to make sure that we're keeping you safe psychologically and physically mm. throughout all the time that you spend with us because we care. <laughs> we care that you do good work because ultimately, let's be, you know, let's not be fluffy about this. We care that you do good work because the better work that you do, the more successful we are as yeah, an organization. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think it's really interesting that you said don't don't dilute mental health by having a standalone policy. I think a lot of people would think that they're doing the opposite of that and giving it its pedestal that it deserves. Right. Yeah. Like, oh, it's really important to us. So it doesn't, we don't want to dilute it by just having it part of health and safety. What we're going to do is put it a standalone piece. I think it's really interesting that you've come at that yeah. from the complete opposite by saying, having it as a standalone dilutes it. Potentially, yeah. and again, this this and it, like anything in this, right? These that this just my opinion. That's what I would do in my business, yeah. But exactly what you just said. in some organisations, the nature and the culture of that organisation that might be more suited to have it as a separate policy. You know, they've got it that way, and having it as a separate policy in that particular organisation, yeah, or organisation X, might actually be of benefit because the employees like it that way. Yeah. Because they know that you live and breathe it. So they're really proud of the fact that you've got that. Yeah. But this is the thing. We try to fit square pegs into round holes when it comes to mm. workplace mental health. Okay. Yeah. What goes back to what I said right the way back about implementing frameworks. Yeah. And it's you do the bits that apply to you in the way that work for your business. Mm. If you don't, it's not going to work. Mm. So it's got to be organization fit value fit people fit and you've got to ask your people along the way what what i love about what you're saying here right is that like that within safety particularly within health and safety but not just within health and safety i think i think 
everywhere. We are addicted to trying to find one simple so, solution. One, two, step one, two, three, four, and five. And that's how we manage X. Step one, two, three, four, and five. And that's how we manage it. Where did you get that? Or oh, we nicked that off DuPont or we nicked that off Coca-Cola or, or whatever, mm-hmm. right? Um, and I think ultimately, like if you look at say 45,001, I, I had a meeting with a with a prospective client a few weeks ago. Um, and they said, Oh, you know, can we get 45,001? I said, yeah, 100%. How much will it cost? I said, I'll tell you what, it'll cost more to get it from me than it will from maybe a couple of other companies. Um, and, I'll, and I'll tell you why. Because to what we said earlier, you know, I, I, I want to try and implement in your company to the spirit of it, not the word of it. So we come back to what we said earlier. If you read through 45,001 and you, well, you read through it. It's not a step-by-step. It's a, it's a, broad framework and there are millions of ways to do what's within it absolutely and and it is like it might say have this for example but there are like 20 different versions of this that you have and when you get when you get organizations that essentially maybe sell a 45,003 one whatever management system like I'm, i'm always a bit like but how do you know that that version of that management system is going to work? Like mm. it, it, it wouldn't work. So I, I said to them, it's going to cost more coming in for me because I will spend a hell of a lot more time in your organization and it will feel like I'm achieving nothing. But what I'm doing is just listening, watching, talking and, and seeing what works and what doesn't work. Mm. I'm going to go home, I'm going to make a form, make a template, tweak it from something I've used somewhere else. And I'm going to bring it in. I'm going to say, try this. And then, yeah. oh, actually that, that doesn't work. And I had this the other day and we, designed a management system for another client and the way that we had designed the the kind of incident reporting process didn't work it clashed with their fleet management and insurance it, it didn't work e- and, and then, uh, so we made a new one either of those ways were within the framework of forty five thousand one. one e- either or absolutely they're completely different yeah and and it was just like there's a bit of a I'm not a frustration, I suppose, but like, well, there is a frustration from a business owner point of view that it's like they'll come to me and my my quote will be X thousands more than than somebody else. And you're like, oh, yeah, but I think we'll genuinely, if you give us a chance, I think you'll see long term more return on investment than you would Absolutely. doing Absolutely. it to the to the word of the to the yeah. letter of the law kind of thing. Yeah. Um, and just to kind of I just wanted to kind of go back on some of the numbers on 45,001 because I found them now. I couldn't remember them off the top of my head. But in 2018, because that you know, I sort of release the stats, don't they, every three years of, of the numbers of certificates that there are. Um, so in across all the 10 major ISO accreditations, there were 1.7 million certifications recorded worldwide. Right. And that's for all it, of them. All of them. Eleven percent right. of for 45,001. But in 2018, there were only 12,000 45,001 certificates issued, okay? Which right. makes sense because it was relatively new from 18,001. Yeah. yeah. In 2019, it went up to 38,000. Wow. Guess what it is in 2020? <sighs> I'll try to tell on that rate of, so in one year, it went from 11 to 38. If it was a continue at that rate, Jesus, it must be like 60 something percent. Does it mean 60,000? Uh, oh, sorry, yeah. Uh, so how many were they at? 38,000, 11,000 to 38? I'm terrible. Call it 12,000 to 39,000 North Carolina. Right. Yeah, 60, 70? 195,000. Oh, shit, I was way off. <laughs> <laughs> Which is brilliant. That's 195,000 organisations that already have the management systems in place yeah. 45,001 that don't have to do a massive amount of work potentially with the right tools, what the right support, working with the right organization to take them to 45,003. What's the uptake on? Do you have figures for 45,003 on there or not? I don't know. No. Sure. And uh, from what I know of people that are being certified, because there's still a big education piece. People might be working to the spirit of 45,003, but they don't understand necessarily that they can get certified. Yeah. So M- MCOR UK was one of the first companies to get certified to 45,003 in the UK, and they got that really quickly. Yeah. And that's because they've already done the hard work. And, and speaking to Hayley Farrell at MCOR, you know, and I said to her about her, her certification, and 
what have you. And she said, Sheila, this is literally the start of our journey. Mm. Yeah. This isn't where we, this isn't where we want to end up. This is the beginning for us. Yeah. Because it's continuous. And I absolutely loved that. I absolutely loved that. That's, I was really like, nice. that's, yeah. amazing. that's fantastic. That's music to my ears. The fact that they're, they're here already, they're doing the right things to get them that certification right now, but they're just seeing this as the start of their journey. Mm. And I thought that was fantastic. That's lovely. I really yeah. like that. Yeah. Trying to find if there, if there are any numbers, but there isn't. There isn't yet, no. It's probably too early on. They don't want to put out yeah. numbers, do they? No. Yeah. And there's still there's still a massive education piece to be done, you know. And there's been a lot of interest. I used to, I, I used to run free webinars on this through lockdown, and I'm going to start right. them up again um, now. Uh, I'm just planning to put them back on. Um, and there was a lot of interest. Yeah. There was a lot of interest, and uh, and I'm presenting on it this afternoon to construction companies that yeah, no. I've heard of, some some of them haven't heard of it yet. No. I think there's a lot of people that haven't heard of it. I mean, you look, yeah. like I say, there's, there's loads of people that have never heard of the management system and, and the management standards from the HSC. And how long's that been out? Jesus Christ. 2004, isn't it? So, what, Phenomenal. 18 that's years. So long. And that's a cracking piece of cracking piece of work. And it's free of charge. Sit in there, download it, off you go. Yeah. And even even the survey stuff that, that the HSE do, we did that in my last um, employed role. And it was a cracking little survey. And, um, and it was... Dirt cheap compared to some others. Mine's better. Quite so. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus. Well, I'm kidding. Well, I'm not, but there's, enough, there's truth in there. <laughs> Brilliant. Oh, great stuff. Like it's um. Oh, I, I appreciate that. Thank you very much, uh, Sheila. I think that was a good, nice conversation. I mean, it was kind of more around like how to how and who should do this stuff but but ultimately i, I know you've got a busy day and, and so have i so i don't want to keep you much longer. yeah um but um yeah is there any kind of closing points anything that you didn't cover that you want to you want to make sure that you say or are you you have... no i think i kind of yeah i think i told people off enough oh i'll tell you what we didn't put in there was um about catch the wave with iosh yeah do you want to give a quick shout out to to that so, you know, one of the other things I would recommend for health and safety professionals, um, I know that Louise Hoskin um, is really passionate about workplace mental health and the role of uh, safety professionals in developing um, not what she would call soft skills, which I, and I love what Louise calls them. She calls them power skills in this particular area because it's often seen as a soft skill, this, this space. Uh, when actually it's at, it's probably one of the hardest things to do. Uh, mm. And there's a there's a campaign that you should kind of pick up on um, either through Louise's uh, LinkedIn page uh, or just by Googling it, which is the Catch the Wave campaign that I also run in to raise awareness yeah. um, on kind of, you know, the role of the profession in, in this particular area. So if we could, uh, you know, kind of pop that in the show notes so that people can, out, uh, yeah. can pick up on that one um, and kind of, you know, just understand what what others in in your profession um are actually doing yeah 100 percent. yeah and do you want to tell us just quickly about uk psych health and safety podcast your your podcast as yeah well? sure sure so yeah we've been uh, so myself and peter kelly um who co-hosts the show with me we talk to uh, a number of different people throughout the profession so whether that and we look to get um guests on um from all of these different areas so going back to your point earlier james about whose responsibility is this where does it sit mm -hmm. it sits with everybody so you know it, we've interviewed occupational health um professionals yeah. uh we've had the society for occupational health on there um we've interviewed louise from iosh mm -hmm. um peter cheese from the uh, the head of the cipd so yep. there are a number of different professionals academics that we've interviewed nice. and also uh, health and safety risk professionals uh, barristers and lawyers yeah. oh. okay uh, in particular well, there was um, a lady called Laura Thomas who's a, a well-respected um, uh, risk um, barrister risk lawyer uh, and another chap called um, Gerard Fallin and again one, in, one of the interesting points that Gerard um, made is that actually in courts of law things and because Gerard's a, a, a passionate advocate of 45,001 uh, and he was saying that more and more now these documents and on organizations are being asked in courts of law you know to what degree have you followed the guidance 
yeah. the standards that are available to you are 45,000 one because people can no longer complain didn't know how to do it gov there isn't enough best practice out there yeah I, so, I think that's really interesting. interesting as well because there's um the hse science division did um a paper a fair few years ago now on um the pitfalls and and best practice for risk assessment and one of the things they found in there was that a lot of people don't use don't use or follow best practice and 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 they kind of allude to in there like the risk assessment becomes less of a um uh, has less of a mass i, I wouldn't say they were saying I think it kind of alluded to saying if you follow best practice, essentially like industry agreed best practice. So your trade association said this is the way to install X, for example, uh, in the safest way forward. It, it kind of alludes to the fact that you wouldn't need to do a risk assessment. I'm not saying don't do that, but it kind of alludes to it. So it kind of break the law if you didn't. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but I think the message that the message that I yeah. took away from that is just actually how powerful and effective industry-wise best practice um could be for you so even if you're just referencing it you're you're using it to inform your risk assessments and so on i don't think the hsc as the enforcer are saying don't do a risk assessment no, of course um not. but it but it, it it kind of reads like that and you're like wow that if if they're writing it in that manner that it could be interpreted like that there must be a lot of faith in those best practice so I think that's really interesting to hear that it's that it's from coming from the courts as well now. Um, so yeah, nice, nice. And um, finally, do you want to give a little plug to your company as well? So clearly, you do very good stress and well-being surveys. <laughs> we do we do? We don't just uh, so yeah. So we talked about the bookends before, yeah. So lots of organisations out there do the bookends. We do the bookends, yeah. So we we do we do um, offer mental health first aid training. We do offer standalone employee assistance programs um, and we do the health promotion stuff the team building days the nutrition all of the stuff that you'll find in a typical well-being program the bit that we do in the focus area for us though is really working with organizations using our digital tools um, to to put in place a fully operation of uh, a very systemic um, integrated management system yeah. aligned to 45,003. So we can take you through 45,003 every single step of the way. We can give you all of the tools that you need to execute 45,003 every step of the way. The education piece, the resources, the training, the gap analysis, the, you know, the audit on what you've currently got. So we look at that whole end-to-end -end process to not give you, this is your quick fix for the next three months, but to, to work with you and say, okay, what are your quick wins? What are some of the quick fixes you want that are going to make you feel well? Yeah. They're going, to, they're going to tick, you know, tick a box if you will. But what's your six month plan? What's your 12 month plan? What's your three year plan? What's your five year plan? What does yeah. a successful business with your people in it look like? And we help them to achieve that. Nice. I like that. Yeah, you see, you got your lift, you got your elevator speech there. That was really good. You're gonna to have to send me the recording now, so go back and type it up. <laughs> Let me phone. What's your elevator pitch? <laughs> Play. Well, take me out. <laughs> you put that done in your sixty seconds. Be... <laughs> I don't oh. think I could say anything in sixty seconds. I talk too much. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, uh, Sheila, thank you very much for that. Um, no worries. We'll get your website, your email address and phone number and stuff, and we'll put that in the show notes yeah. as well. So uh, thank you very much, Sheila, for coming on the podcast. Thank you. Okay, peeps, hope you enjoyed that conversation. Thank you very much, Sheila, uh, for coming on. We'll put all the links to everything in the description below. Put the links to the podcast in the description below so you can go and check that out. I'll put the links to the management standard below as well because um, I've mentioned that quite a few times. And also, obviously, 45,000 are free. Um, we'll link the kind of live reader so you can get it free all linked below if you need any support of this stuff we'll link sheila's uh company as well um if you need any support technical transformational risk management stuff uh or the media services as well we'll put the links to riskfluentlimited.com my email address and more in the description below don't forget to follow us on the social media guess where the links for that are in the description below oh yes other than that catch you next week safe Oh.
The views and opinions expressed in this podcast are those of the host and its guests and do not necessarily reflect the position of the companies. Examples of analysis discussed within this podcast are examples only based on limited and dated open source information and should not be utilised in real life as the only solution available. Assumptions made within this analysis are not reflective of the position of the companies. No part of this podcast may be reproduced, stored or transmitted in any form or by any means, mechanical, electronic or otherwise, without prior written permission from James McPherson.